Hello, and welcome to another edition of Academic Matters. I'm Joe Marbach, the Provost at LaSalle University. In this segment, I'm joined by Dr. Stupenda Davis, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Urban Public Health and Nutrition, and also the director of the undergraduate program. Supenda, thank you, and welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure. Um, give the folks at home a little bit of your background um, and how you ended up here at LaSalle. Okay, well, background, I was born and raised in Camden, New Jersey, and I've studied public health from undergrad through my doctorate degree. Uh, prior to coming to LaSalle, I was a training specialist for the, the Health Federation of Philadelphia for eight years, and that required me to coordinate trainings for HIV uh, specialists and providers in the city. I learned about the position, and I figured I would, I would apply for it. One of the things that really attracted me to the, to the position was um, working at uh, LaSalle University. Um, I, did, I, was born, I was raised Catholic, and so just having that background and then just being in Philadelphia, although I'm from Camden, it's right across mm -hmm. the bridge, I do like working in the city of Philadelphia. Um, I thought it would be great to direct an undergrad program in public health because I know for myself, as an undergraduate student at Rutgers, I did not know what public health was. So I felt that I would meet a lot of students that were probably in the same situation that I was, not really knowing what public health was and being able to explain to them what it entails, what types of careers are related to the field, and um, thought I would be able to do um, some justice in the yeah. program. Well, let me pick up on that. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like a very broad field, public health. Um, what is it? What, if a student comes in mm -hmm. and says, Dr. Davis, I'm thinking about majoring in public health. What, what do I do with a public health degree, and, and what, what are my options? What right. do you tell students? Right, so you're, you are correct. It is a very broad field, which is, um, which is a blessing. So with public health, it's basically the field that focuses on disease prevention and health promotion. We focus on disease prevention and working with communities and special populations. So those communities could be actual neighborhoods, but it could also be as broad as countries. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of careers, someone that graduates with a Bachelor of Science in Public Health, they could be a health educator where they go into communities and increase awareness about different diseases such as obesity or heart disease or talk about HIV prevention. It also involves, um, there's an environmental health component, so sometimes we have students that are interested in air quality, water quality, also looking at condition of housing. Mm -hmm. Then you have um, some students that may be interested in working with numbers, working with data. So you have statistics for those that are interested in looking at um, trends in disease. Mm -hmm. Then you also have epidemiology, which is investigating the cause of disease and also controlling the spread of disease. And we've been hearing a lot about that when you look at e the Ebola virus. Sure, so you yeah. hear a lot about that. So usually those are public health epidemiologists that are working on those um, particular cases. And that would be somebody who would try to even trace back to sometimes they call patient zero. Exactly, or the, or the, the, the host patient, the, yeah. right? And then another piece of, health edu of public health is health education, which is my particular expertise in my particular area. And that is uh, studying, um, looking at how behavior impacts health. And so how by encouraging populations to either start engaging in healthy behaviors or maintaining, they can um, prevent disease or bad health. And then mm -hmm. you have the policy piece as well for those that want to do some legislative work, maybe advocate for populations that can't advocate for themselves, such as LGBT populations or minority populations. So it is very broad, but it's great because we feel that with public health, there is a, a career for anyone that's interested in and impacting the health of populations. Yeah, it sounds like it's very interdisciplinary, and I know that um, since we established the program, I guess, four, four or five years ago now, um, with a master's in public health yes. and now the undergraduate degree, there's a lot of interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary work um, that's going on. Um, and, and so we've brought faculty in from arts and sciences, from mm -hmm. nursing, uh, some from business, I guess, to some extent. Um, so. I guess what I'm puzzled with is okay. we call it urban public health. Why the distinction of urban public health? Well, when you look at where LaSalle University is located, you know, one of the things we always talk about is that we are a part of that community. 
And so with that, there are different factors that are related to, you know, health status, mm -hmm. you know? And so when you're looking at different factors such as, you know, low income housing or just having, you know, food deserts where there's not a lot of stores that provide fresh fruits and vegetables, um, an area that may have um, some issues in terms of violence, all those things will impact someone's, you know, their health status as well as any behaviors that they engage in. And so it's something that we make sure that we encompass in terms of the public health aspect. So it is, in, in essence, it's really part of the mission of LaSalle University exactly. to be a, a faithful member of the community and to uh, really pull up and help and assist folks in the community. Right. And then also, too, I mean, one of the things that we strive for is just, you know, social, ju social justice and equality and making sure that, you know, people are getting the care and access to health that they need and as well as um, the, the knowledge that they need. In, in terms of the issues, I, I guess there are some that are unique to urban settings and some to suburban and, mm -hmm. and rural. Uh, are the, are the magnitude of the problems greater in an urban setting because of the concentration of the population? Or might it be that there are greater problems in rural areas because there's less, less access? Right, it's a combination of the two. So when you're talking about, um, like you said, the rural areas, so you have some individuals that the nearest hospital or health center is two, three hours away, you know, or they may not have um, a lot of the transportation systems that we have in in the city to have that access. So you do have that issue. In terms of um, lower income populations, what the, the issues that are there is the different things that we encourage communities to do, they don't really have those resources. So maybe if we say, you know, you need to exercise more. Well, maybe they don't have the resources to join a gym. Or maybe if they can't join, they can't join a gym, you can say, okay, well, you can jog outside. Well, maybe the area that they live in is not safe, mm -hmm. or if the area is safe, maybe they are not, maybe the sidewalks are not well maintained, maybe the streets may have cracks. So there's all these different factors that are outside of the person that will impact the, the behaviors that, that they engage in. Again, like I said, you know, um, usually in, in the city, you have a lot of mom and pop stores that may not sell fresh fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, even when you're looking at maybe families you have large families, it may be more cost efficient to, you know, spend a few dollars on soda, maybe something from the Chinese food store, whereas it's going to cost more money to get something that's more healthy. So, you know, many times um, people that are, not, that are not aware of these factors may say, well, you know, they just don't want to be healthy. They just want to eat that. And I'm like, well, sometimes it's an issue of, you know, how much money do I have to feed my family? Okay. So that, that plays a big part of it, too. Now, your specialty is uh, public health education. Yes. What, what are the challenges in, in educating the public? Um, and does it happen in waves? You know, I'm thinking of, you know, the dangers of smoking, okay. which, you know, in the 50s and 60s, everybody was uh, mm -hmm. lighting up. But, you know, we slowly have gotten to the point where the, the health risks associated with smoking are, are pretty well known. Um, it, is that the, the challenge of how do you communicate the information and, and what role is technology playing in, in helping to educate the public? Well, some of, some of the challenges are, like you said, the education piece. Some people, there are still some myths related to um, smoking or one of the things too, when you're looking at health, health behavior and behavior change, the individual has to look at him or herself to see, am I really at risk for engaging? If I, am I at risk for developing lung cancer, let's say mm -hmm. for smoking cigarettes? If the person doesn't feel that they're at risk, they're not more than likely not gonna change their behavior. Um, so one of it is education, are there, are there mixed messages? So dispelling any myths that are out there. Also doing different things to let that person know that they may be at risk for a particular disease or condition um, what is their susceptibility to it? Um, but when you're looking at behavior change, there's a lot of different factors. So let's say that I am a smoker and I want to quit smoking. If my partner is a smoker, my partner is my, my, my social support system, that mm -hmm. can be a barrier for me to change my behavior because I, instead of you know, him encouraging me to quit smoking, he may look down on me that I'm not smoking because that's going to impact my interaction with It could with have him. been your quality time together, Exactly. Right? And so that sometimes is. that barrier may override, that, that, that barrier may override the benefit of me quitting smoking. 
And so that's what happens when you're looking at behavior change. Another thing too, in terms of um, the education, in terms of technology, again, a lot, of me, a lot of it may be mixed messages. You know, what is out there on the media? Where are people getting their information? Are they getting their information from news? Are they getting it from blogs? Are they getting it from Facebook or from Twitter? You mean so, everything you hear on the internet is not true? <laughs> And so, you know, people are getting their information, but they may not know what the source of that information is, mm -hmm. or they may be getting information from a source that's not reputable. And so that's important, too. Yeah. How, how does a public health worker overcome that then? I mean, is it specific outreach to communities? Are you working with different types of groups, uh, church groups, uh, social groups? Is, is that one way of getting around this? That is one way. So one of the things that... Um, that health educators do often is to conduct a needs assessment. So let's say that I want to talk to a community about HIV prevention. So one of the things I have to start with is to find out what do they know? You know, find out what they know. And then in, the, in them get, getting that information, I may learn what the myths are. I may learn what the fears are. So I have to start there first. Mm -hmm. And it may be in getting that information that the participants or the target audience, they may feel like, oh, that's not a problem. You know, we don't have to worry about that anymore. And that's where I start, kind of seeing mm -hmm. where they are and then figuring out where do I need to go from there. And it sounds like if there are still myths, I know I need to increase awareness, give them information, and then start talking about prevention methods and behavior change. But I need to start with the education piece too, I mean, mm -hmm. first. Yeah, mm -hmm. Assessing it first. Uh, mm -hmm. Supendo, we're just about out of time. Okay. If um, anybody at home watching is interested in learning more about the program, what's the best way of contacting you or finding out more about our program at LaSalle? Well, the best way is to contact me uh, via email. <laughs> and my email address is davisz at lasalle.edu. I'm also going to uh, www.lasalle.edu um, slash bph. Bph, mm -hmm. okay. So for the and um, one thing I do want to say is that tonight we are having a domestic violence awareness event, and um, that's going to be held in a chapel from 5 to 6.15. And so we want to increase awareness in the LaSalle community as well as Philadelphia community the about community domestic violence and how it's impacting our communities. Okay, and is that a theme all semester long? Well, actually, um, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and we wanted to make sure that we did a program. Good but you, you probably have seen um, similar themes. We've been talking about sexual assault, which has been um, one of the major things we've been talking Big about this semester. Campus. Yes, okay. as well as um, human trafficking. Okay. So it's all around that same violence all prevention right, thank piece. Thank you. Okay, my guest has been Dr. Subenda Davis, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Urban Public Health and Nutrition. Please stay tuned. I'll be joined by Dr. George Boudot, assistant professor in the history department. Hey fellow TV viewers, are you bored? Are you tired of the same old shows? Having thousands of channels to watch, but there's nothing there? Tired of sitting by yourself on your old mama's striped couch? Sitting in your room by yourself, watching someone who resembles your grandfather? Yeah, I know. I used to be just like you. By now, all hope is lost. You're flipping through channels, wondering what to watch. Boring. Boring, 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 boring. Wait, what's this? LaSalle TV. It's new, it's bold, it's great. It's not your ordinary TV. I'm Steve Graham, reporter for LTV News. I'm Corey Meredith. I'm reporter Madison Elliott. Hello, I'm Brendan Rigney here. And, and welcome to LTV News. Let's step back and take a look at the world. I'm here to tell you what's the buzz in Philadelphia. Let's check it out. It's an eclectic mix. I don't think that this taps is the way to do it. They actually have a little celebration going on. and I think it's a step in the right direction. I'm sitting down with my friend and fellow colleague for LaSalle TV, Jacob Smolinski. Oh, we've got Miss Pinup. We've got Mr. Classy Designer. <laughs> 
Polarizing news reporter and political commentator Chris Matthews. September 28th was a most auspicious day for the 52nd annual Puerto Rican Day Parade. Finagling his way back into her life is Brendan Rigney, LTV Charmer. Alongside of me, SGA president and dear friend, Mucky Torres. Groovy. Now let's talk fashion. Reporter Steve Graham had the opportunity to cover the event. The talent is evidently here. It's big plans. So, I don't know. Some really great things going on. Welcome back to Academic Matters. I'm Joe Marbach, the provost here at LaSalle University. In this segment, I'm, jo I'm joined by Dr. George Brudeau. Did I get that right, George? Close, close, enough. close provost. Uh, who is uh, assistant professor in our Department of History and also the director of our public history program. George, welcome to the program. Uh, I appreciate you. your indulgence. Thank you, thank you. Um, give us a little bit of your background um, and how you got into the profession and public history and how you ended up here at LaSalle. This is your first semester. This, um, I'm brand new, so it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I've been a public historian um, most of my life and a historian since the beginning of my undergrad, undergrad days at Manchester College in Indiana. Uh, so when the position opened here, it was sort of a coming together of all worlds. I guess I could sort of look at my, my work in public history going back to the spring of 1976 when my folks uh, you know, crammed us into the family's Chevy station wagon and drove here for uh, the bicentennial trip that everyone was supposed to make. Mm -hmm. So I have childhood pictures of myself and my sister in the Liberty Bell, and um, I guess that's where I got it all started. Um, many, many years later, here I am writing about the Liberty Bell. Okay. Well, for folks that may not understand what public history is, what is it that we're teaching students, and, and specifically in our graduate program mm. where we've got a, a very active public history program. What is it? What is public history? Public history is an application of the academic discipline of history to a general audience. Public historians do things like they're the park rangers who, when you go and see Independence Hall, those are public historians. Public historians are archivists, uh, rare book librarians, uh, costumed interpreters are, are public historians, and a whole host of other things. But the emphasis is taking it out of the classroom uh, and the strong disciplinary background there to a broad general audience. Okay. How receptive are our students? I, I mean, this was a program, predates your coming on board, mm -hmm. where we thought, oh, we'll develop a track or two, a course or two. But it's actually quite... Uh, successful and it's got a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. Where's uh, it coming from? Well, I think people are fascinated by history, but a, a lot of it is the discipline grew in the 1960s and 1970s. It was definitely an outlet for folks who, did, who weren't necessarily going to go be a professor somewhere. Um, I, was, uh, I was astounded when I uh, first came here to, and interviewed in the winter at the quality of students LaSalle has, at the enthusiasm. Um, we're in the perfect location for it, and that was one of the things that really shocked me. And of course, LaSalle is a, a part of the campus as a national historic landmark, so that's an added advantage. Uh, I had joked with the administration at my previous university, if you want me to stay here till retirement, you need to buy me a historic house uh, to play with. Well, uh, during my interview, uh, all of you presented me with the Charles Wilson Peel House Belfield and the story of the Worcester family who later lived there. So that was very exciting, and we're doing some very exciting programming in the days ahead. Uh, dealing with that and getting more involved with the great community around us. Yeah, it's actually been uh, a, a, a hidden gem in, in a way that we're mm -hmm. starting to take advantage of. Uh, I know you're involved a little bit with our museum on campus mm -hmm. and the History Hunters, yeah. which features the, the Peel House, mm -hmm. um, and then they'll come into the uh, mm -hmm. museum itself and, and look at some artwork by Peel and, and some of his contemporaries. Mm -hmm. Give us a little thumbnail on who Charles Wilson Peel was. Um, uh, he's a fascinating character, and that was, uh, I have to admit, uh, like a lot of people, when you first uh, get invited to LaSalle, I wasn't, although I live less than two miles from here, I wasn't exactly sure how to get here. So I got quite lost driving through the sites I knew in the wonderful historic Germantown community and came up 20th Street and saw the living example of Peel's Belfield uh, house. Peel was a, a Maryland-born painter. Uh, he became fascinated by art. 
Uh, he moved to Philadelphia because there were better opportunities here. He moved here from Annapolis. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he became just a linchpin of everything going on uh, with the American Enlightenment and with the growing revolutionary movement. Um, he is, he, he's almost like the Zelig char character in the Woody Allen movie. He just seems to be there. When Benedict Arnold uh, is discovered in treason, Charles Wilson Peale is the guy who builds a float that goes through the streets of Philadelphia with a rotating head of uh, Benedict Arnold on one side and Satan on the other. Um, he's the guy who decorated the bridge that George Washington comes over to be inaugurated president. And he is just one of the most delightful, fantastic artists who just captured a generation. Um, he was fascinated by all of the aspects of the Enlightenment, art, science, history. And he leaves us this legacy that's both in our, our museum to uh, an extent, but also he is an important part of the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, mm -hmm. the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which has some of his treasures. Uh, and Independence National Historic Park, uh, in their second bank exhibit, has his great collection. He wanted to capture the faces, the visages of the founding fathers. He thought if you could just see this, this strain of greatness going through these men's faces. Um, and he's just a part of the community. He just seemed to know everybody and talk to everybody. And Yeah, that's my understanding. He's just tied in with the leading families of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. He probably painted many of them oh, in terms absolutely of the portraits. Did, yeah. um, but, uh, so, so tell us more about that. Philadelphia it must be a great laboratory in it terms is. of public history. And I know your own work and mm -hmm. research has been around Philadelphia and uh, uh, that, that period of time. It was, yeah, uh, and, it, and it still is. Um, you know, I, when I was interviewing here, one of the things that people kept saying to me was, uh, Philadelphia is LaSalle's biggest classroom. Um, and it is a fantastic laboratory. Um, this semester in my History of Philadelphia undergraduate course, uh, I give a weekly assignment. That, um, the kids have to use the subway, have to get off campus, have to uh, see things. And they're going seeing everything from abandoned factory sites uh, to Independence Hall and the Powell House. So it's just a, the opportunities here are just uh, fantastic. Yeah, and I know we have uh, try to take full advantage of it with our cultural passport, mm -hmm. which gives students access to about 40 different museums and social and other cultural events uh, throughout the city. It's, it's uh, a wonderful program. If, you did, if it hadn't existed when I arrived here, I would have begged you to start it. Uh, I, I talked to a student today who hasn't used the subway yet and doesn't go downtown, and I said, you know, this is going to stop. Uh, LaSalle will get you off campus by, next, by this semester. So um, it's just a great connection, and we're, we're the, Broadway, the Broad Street subway line away from yeah. all of this. And, and as we talked about in the previous segment about urban public health, well, that's LaSalle is part of the Philadelphia community, and to take advantage of the historical sites um, mm -hmm. really fits in well, and I think that's also led to that growth of that graduate program in that's, public health. That's been, that's been really fantastic. As a public historian, um, our opportunities to work with and to really help improve the community, the LaSallean tradition of commitment to the community around us, uh, which I knew nothing of when I interviewed here, and uh, over the months in between, is, I've really uh, gotten into hook, line, and sinker. Um, the, the, I mean, we're right on the edge of historic Germantown, and that's nationally one of the great public history success stories of getting independent, individual, um, diverse sites to work together beautifully. Uh, they've created an amazing education program in History Hunters that's just top notch, and it's really stepping out of the traditional lines, the traditional boundaries of public history, and taking it to a great broad audience. Yeah, I understand there was a reenactment of the Battle of Germantown uh, I did, a week uh, or so that, ago. That was, I, 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 did, I, I attended it with my students. It's a fantastic thing to see. Yeah, we, uh, we lost again, though, I'm told. We, the, uh, British, the British beat us. The kids also, the kids were enthusiastic to see it, and enthusiastic to talk about Philadelphia during the war, and enthusiastic to go to historic Grumblethorpe, where they were reproducing a historic uh, a beer garden, which our students were very enthusiastic to, uh, to study. Certainly can understand that. Yeah, I, George, we've got about three minutes left. Tell me a little bit about your uh, research and, and where it's going and where it's been. Well, I'm a, I'm a historian, so I, I work uh, primarily on the eight, Philadelphia and the age of Benjamin Franklin. So I'm working on Franklin's life in Philadelphia and in London. So that uh, fortunately keeps having me bouncing uh, one to the other. Mm -hmm. So that's the archive part of my life. And I'm also a functioning public historian. So I'm working on a book, too, on how to interpret historic sites and to get out of the old model that it is just um, wealthy people of a certain social class, of a certain social milieu, but to take it to a broader audience. And we've seen such great things nationally in the last few years. Some of it very controversial, like the story of the President's House down in Independence mm -hmm. Park and mm -hmm. the fact that we didn't talk about slavery in Philadelphia. 
um, talking about um, different ethnicities uh, and, and the way our immigrant ancestors came to America and what their experience has been like, and to try and expand these stories to, tell, to talk about a, a bigger story to a broader audience. So it's uh, making it accessible to people in ways that it's, it mm -hmm. hadn't, hadn't been before because it was just kind of what we found in the textbooks and I, it focused on the leadership rather than the, the people. Traditionally, museums were the were the realm of the elite. There's a joke in Philadelphia that one noted museum refused to use the phone book, it would only use the social pages. Um, that's changing, and we're seeing, as we see with the kids coming to LaSalle campus all the time, it's, um, it, you know, it's, a, it's a much broader audience, a much, a much bigger story now. That's uh, great. Now, your work with, you, with Franklin and going back and mm -hmm. forth, um, that's, that's already resulted in a book. It, it did. It, it, my, my book, Independence, came out uh, in early 2012. Uh, thank heavens, it was nice to see that finally get out of my hard drive and onto pages. And that was very nicely received, and I've appreciated that. And, and was there a next volume? or? That's, uh, my, my publishers talked to me about another book about Philadelphia. I told them I have to get through the two I have in the hopper first, and then we do that. And, okay. and behave myself for all of you, so you'll keep me around That's for right, a few That's right, we want to keep you around for a while. Uh, George, we've got uh, less than a minute. If folks at home are interested in public history mm -hmm. or the program we have at LaSalle, what's the best way for them to contact you contact and learn me, about the program? Sure. Contact me through the history department here. They always can keep track of me and through LaSalle's website, which is undergoing some nice changes right now, but we're growing the public history uh, uh, centers. Uh, so at LaSalle.edu and, yeah. and search history? Uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, there. Just, just look on history and you'll, you'll find me pretty quickly. Okay. There aren't many Boudreaux around here, so. Thank you. Thank you. All right, George. Uh, my guest has been Dr. George Brudeau. Close. We're gonna I'll work, work on that. My French is just not there. Who is the assistant professor in the Department of History here at LaSalle University. Once again, my name is Joe Marbach. I'm the provost here at LaSalle. Thank you for watching. Why? Well,